Well, good day, folks. It's Dr. Doug Pernikoff of Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show and my wonderful co-host, Marion Brinkner. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm back. Okay, I'm back. Okay, okay. My wonderful co-host, Cindy Vickers, and it's great to see her. She's looking super duper. And we were out last week. We were both very busy with life. But today we're back, and we were going to talk about a couple of different topics. First of all, we thought we'd talk. It's a little bit early, but it's starting to get dramatically colder. You mean like 75 and 80 this week? <laughs> yeah, I'm sweating today. <laughs> but, but but yesterday it was cold, okay. and last night it was cold. We are uh, organized and prepared ahead of time. Absolutely. Not last minute stuff for us. Right. We, we didn't start the topic until about two hours ago. What so are we we're, talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to start, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, pre winter thoughts and preparation for our pets and then we'll follow up um, i thought we'd either in a second segment if we don't run over then we'll talk a little bit about a sadder subject but one that i've had to deal with a lot lately this last two weeks at the clinic and that's elective euthanasia in pets and then if that uh, doesn't boil over then <laughs> the third really segment horrible. i'm really optimistic about the show today <laughs> crying too hard <laughs> anyway uh the first topic we were thinking about is winter and again it's not winter yet we've got a while but we are getting some serious cold spells here and there and i want people to be aware and i'll probably reiterate some of these points as we get closer to a true winter season but i think it's important to understand and plan so the first thing i always talk about is you know what do you have to do to prep your critters for winter i mean if it's a dog or a cat well first of all i have a, a question that uh, is a precursor to that and it's you said we we're talking about pre-winter are we allowed to talk about being actually in winter or sure. only pre-winter no, okay i just want to clarify because yeah, i want to uh, and you're not a, being graded today by the way uh, well all okay. right <laughs> I like no, to that's do a my good best. Point. That's a good point. Why don't we start with um, cats? Because we don't typically talk about cats as much, but there's some very characteristic issues that we have to worry about with cats because, number one, a lot of people let their cats go outside, outside, inside. So... You, I don't know if you have cat. You have a cat inside, though. I do have a cat. And by the way, this particular cat, I'm going to do a shameless plug here, is uh, a cat that actually that I have, but is a wonderful 10-year-old cat that needs a home with somebody who is probably just needs a companion. And I think maybe somebody a little bit more elderly. Uh because you don't want to get a cat when you're a kitten who could live for 18 years. But he's 10, has never had a litter box accident. He's a short-haired, very soft black cat. Does that mean he always has accidents outside the litter box? No, he's never had an accident oh, okay. in that he's always used his litter box okay. every religiously for 10 years. And just, he is incredibly affectionate. He just wants somebody who will hang out with him so he can sit on their lap or right next to him all day. That's all he wants to do in the I'm whole world. I'm looking for so. the same thing in a, in a relationship. So. Just to sit on your lap all day? Yeah, I don't know how yeah. you're going to do surgery. I'll try. Let me all try. Right. Yeah, there's probably a way. Oh, you probably have already done it and then you know. Yeah, I can't. I, well, never mind. Okay. We're not going to go there. No, let's not do that. <laughs> so, okay, so that's Cindy okay, trying so, to plug her cat. Yeah, oh, so, but the question was, I, yes, I do have a cat, but he, this particular cat does not go outside he is the Claude. However, much to uh, you, you will not like this, but I, if I lived in a different place, I would probably let my cat go outside. Even though there's dangers, I just think they're infinitely happier. And I know, don't call, don't do anything, because I know what the argument is against it. We're going to have to call. You'll call if you want. Family and children <laughs> services. Okay. <laughs> I remember my kids did that to me one time. They, they did? Well, they were little, but they decided that that was the thing to do. What would you do to them? I probably yelled at them or something. And they said, we're going to call the family services and get you in trouble. I said, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, they were coached by their mother. But <laughs> well. <laughs> anyway, well, one thing about cats that I always try and alert people to is that because when they're outside, they do explore. They always seem to be able to deal with the winter. They seem to find places it doesn't take much to hide a cat, right? Some people actually put up little spaces, like they'll put a, a tent structure or just slant it against a, a pin it against a wall, put some hay in there, and just kind of form a windbreak. And, and that's enough. Cats are smart. They're going to figure it out. But one big problem is a lot of times they end up in the car engine area. Yeah. 
because it's warm Mm -hmm. and they get in there and i can't tell you working at the emergency clinic for a number of years how many times almost every year there's at least one episode where an animal gets lost in there that people don't know they turn on the engine and suddenly we're trying to sew up the mm, cat that would be sickening it is sickening but um anyway that it does happen so you alert people and just be aware and uh, you know the thing you can do is obviously set up something in the garage or in the basement whatever you can do and i would prefer they stay inside during the winter uh, but you know some people just don't do that and as long as they keep fresh water some windbreak opportunity so they're out of the inclement weather and um, give them some fresh food let them beef up on the food and eat more I think that a lot of those animals do pretty well. Don't you agree? Um, when I think of it, I think of the, of the cat that just likes to go out and play for a while and comes right back in. I mean, it, that's that's my experience with letting a cat go in. They, they don't really, and when it gets cold, they just stay in a whole lot more. I just had one cat that never used the litter box. Like, he always went outside. Oh. And he, then, he, then he'd come back in, and there it wasn't an issue but i would be really worried about that um i know somebody has a cat that that likes to be outside doesn't want to be inside particularly in the warm weather but when it gets to be winter he's comes in have you ever seen mostly uh, you know i've seen the doggy doors do cats I'm use not those? I'm a huge fan of, but go ahead. Um, I don't know. Well, I mean, probably if you had a doggy door, you know, you know how smart cats are. They could yeah. figure out they could go through it. Yeah, I guess some of them are kind of flaps that you just push through. But I think it's mostly um, an agreement that they have with their owners. You know, yeah. that the people, like, if the, you know, if the door opens, that cat wants to go out, it's like beeline to that door. And yeah. same thing when it wants to come in, except that when they come in, they take their sweet time and you're holding the door open forever. And, well, and it's they, a caricature, but I think it's true. I don't think they alert you as well as dogs do. They don't scratch as effectively or they don't bark that I've ever heard a cat bark. Have you? No, but I certainly, my, the, my cats have been very um, clear about. Vocal about scratching at the door even uh-huh. it's really their pads on the door like uh-huh. it's a big if they want to get into any room and the door is closed it's there's no wow. mistaking it when i say cat, cats i mean cat singular but still yeah. yeah i mean historically you've had a history of cats and stuff like that yeah i've always yeah. mostly i've had a cat yeah yeah very interesting I guess. Well, my, you know, I mean, I, I think most people think of me as a dog person, and I really do love dogs and I love horses, and I like animals in general, but my best stories are cat stories. I mean, the most amazing things that have happened have happened with my cat. Hmm. Do you have one interesting story we could share real quickly? It's not real quick. Okay, forget it. Yeah. <laughs> so now let's talk about some dog issues, okay? So I like to tell people pre winter. Get your dogs checked out. Get your cats checked out. Let the veterinarian give you a look-see. Make sure their weight is up and good and, you know, preparation for whatever excessive cold we're going to have. And I keep hearing we're going to have a terrible winter this year. You do? Yeah. We oh, have snow days, no school? Serious stuff. Good. Oh, <laughs> I forgot you teach. I'm all about it. <laughs> yeah, my wife used to do that. She couldn't wait for a snow day and I mean, she she'd wear herself out waiting for that phone call you know like please call please call so we used to call and fake her out all the time and <laughs> that was funny so some people will suggest feeding them up a little bit depending on how much out time outdoor time they're going to have and um you know do you do you do anything else about grooming and and um do you think that's important to to leave their coats cold. I mean, I know if they're outside. To leave their coats cold? Cold, I mean, long. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think if you take your dog out regularly, if it's a dog that gets groomed, and in the summer you tend to, you know, shave them closely just because it's easy maintenance and because it's so hot out. Yeah, I think you should let it grow a little bit. I mean, it's not so much different than your own hair, but you're not generally, even if for dogs that wear coats, they're, they're not nearly as comprehensive as, say, a human coat and mm-hmm. scarf and a hat and boots. So I think it sounds like a good idea to let their hair grow a little bit. But you have to also be cognizant of the ice and the salt and everything and 
we're probably going to get to that in a minute, but keeping that off their feet, whether you put boots on them or at least rinse their feet. You're so intuitive. I just love the way you just grab the subject. <laughs> it's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> this intuition is just general know-how. Yeah. But you have to be mindful that you really have to still keep them um, groomed, and particularly around their feet, which is a very difficult place to keep combed out or brushed out, actually. So it is. you have to be diligent. Right. And as you alluded to, if they have long hair between their feet and they go out and they get water, iced up, snow on their uh, – the rule of thumb is don't bring them in and try and clip it out because you'll probably cut them. Better off just to warm up the feet and get the stuff to melt. Well, I would Unless say – Unless it's got salt If on you it. have a dog that has um, fur between the pads of their feet, that you should keep that groomed. Not like right, that right. moment do it. Like, you yeah. know, if it's a, if poodle feet, that gets all shaved out. Yeah. And it's mostly poodles, I think, that really have that issue. Uh, you know, you know some, of the, uh, maybe, and some of the field dogs have, you know, that swim and stuff. Some, some of those have a little bit hairier feet. So I would keep that shaved. I would make sure that was clean, so, just so it doesn't have that the ice and that's really the salt or chemicals adhere to it. But stick in their paws in some warm water and rinse. I'm rinsing it. I'm doing the motion of rinsing know, it in a little She looks like she's something. cooking or something. Yeah, some stirring. Yeah, rinse them out and dry it. It's all pain, but you have to do it. Well, the salt can burn them, too, if it gets down to bare skin. If they've got raw skin between their feet, it can be irritating. And, of course, frostbite's a concern, both in the digits, but more importantly, on the ear tips, on the muzzle, and, you know, where else can you get it? If you have a coat in the dog that gets saturated with water, or cold, then it actually becomes like you wearing a t-shirt out in the ice. They can actually get exposure that they don't need. So you have to be careful about too, coat, too short a coat, or especially those breeds that don't have a, a deep undercoat. Well, I honestly cannot in any way condone or imagine leaving any animal outside when it's bitterly cold. Mm -hmm. Going for a walk is important. Right leaving them outside for any extended period of time. I'm talking about you go for a 20 minute walk or maybe you're out for 40 minutes really walking. But other than that, you know, they go outside to go potty and come back in. Well, and you know how many people forget that their pet is outside? They let them out to go to the bathroom and they forget that they're out there. And this happens all the time. So you really, again, I agree with these you. These your to, friends? I mean, who are these people uh, these who are, are doing that? these are my neighbors, yeah, I saw yeah. them, yeah, so. <laughs> Now, you made a good point. Uh, activity is still really important. So if we can't go out and let the dog out in the yard and just do his thing, we're going to have to create play or activity. Well, let's just go back to the beefing them up for the winter. Uh -huh. If if they're not going outside hardly at all and they're staying in a, a house that is heated for your comfort level, they don't need to be beefed up for that because that they're just going to be fat. Right. Uh, but if they're going outside and really exercising, you know, then it makes sense. And I, I would just say, just monitor the dog. You know, if you if the dog is, you've allowed them to put on all this, you know, quote unquote winter weight, winter but they're weight. really not doing anything, then you know, cut back. But if they if you see that they look like they're really cold a lot, and you can tell, I mean, they shiver, and, and avoiding the cold, and if they're getting leaner because uh -huh. they're burning more calories, then you know, increase their food. Huh? So you mean I shouldn't really be eating more now because Are you're trying I'm, to prepare. I'm trying to prepare. Well, I feel uh, like a little fat squirrel, you know, waiting <laughs> for the cold weather. But do I look like a squirrel? Not so much like a squirrel, but you, what do you, I like you in black. Everyone's got black oh, on today, baby. as Joey said. We got oh. Joey's got black on, Ooh, and wow. you've got black, oh, and I'm black. you have black on. So I had a quick question. So there are a lot of play things you can do. You can get hide-and-seek with treats. You can have special toy activity. Um, Kong toys are good because they you can put some peanut butter in there and keep them busy. If you want activity, you can actually introduce a treadmill. And they have special treadmills, but you can just teach a dog to be on a treadmill. Yes, you can. And that's good activity. You need to really have somebody probably tell you or YouTube or something about how. You can't just throw them on the treadmill because that's very no, yeah. scary. But yeah, you have to do it. You're right. Yeah. And then I know there are classes. Sometimes you can find an indoor agility class where it has activity. Or even now, uh, pools are sometimes available for swimming in the wintertime. And uh, I had a question, someone had mentioned to me that you can practice targeting. And I didn't know exactly what targeting meant as a training activity or a play activity. Um, targeting is part of, you know, it's like in the 
Getting quicker training. Getting them to focus on you? Well, you're trying to get them to touch something, touch a target. So yeah. it, um, it starts with something very close, like they touch your hand, or let's suppose you just had a piece of paper, uh-huh. and you want them to touch it with their, let's just say their nose. Mm-hmm. And then when they do it, you reward them to it until they start doing it on their own, and then you can start giving that um, a word, which uh-huh. is, you say touch, or you might call it paper, or mm-hmm. call it whatever you want, mm-hmm. just call it, let's just say, paper Mm -hmm. and every time they touch that paper they get rewarded but well now you can start taking that paper which is your target a target Mm -hmm. can be anything and moving it farther and farther away so you send them out to the target and that's how you start getting exercise very interesting well that's our topic right now for winterization of our pets we'll do more as we get into the season we'll also talk a little bit about thanksgiving and other holiday issues that we have to worry about we're going to take a real quick break and we'll come back with cindy vickers and dr doug pernikoff of dr doug's all things animal it's going to bring your kleenex though because yeah gonna be we're sad. next topic is going to be a sad topic and we'll start when we get back see you in just a minute Welcome back, folks. We're here with Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show, and Cindy and I are uh, co-hosting and talking to one another because no one else will talk to us. <laughs> and, uh, no, I want to talk about this one. This okay. is this is important to talk about. This is a very important topic. We're going to try and get through it fairly quickly, but it's uh, euthanasia, elective euthanasia in our pets. Well, what other kind is there? Some people... Um, I guess it's always elective <laughs> in some form, whether it has to be or doesn't have to be. I guess I'm thinking that you dis- make a distinction between, and as a veterinarian, I see this every day. Some people come in and they want, they decide they want to euthanize their animal because most often it's related to some circumstance like a chronic issue, like chronic ears or chronic skin or anything, even a chronic illness. So that's a little more... Uh, I think acceptable, but these first two decisions, I'm always amazed that these people, especially at the beginning of the new year, they'll clean house. I was at a clinic one time, I couldn't tolerate it, I had to leave, but they would, every winter, I may have mentioned this once before, Christmas and New Year, hordes of these animals would come in, literally, and they said, well, it's time to put them to sleep. Why? Oh, he's just overweight, and he's got these chronic ears, and and it comes down to dollars, obviously, and I think inconvenience. So, you know, the problem is, in the by law, a pet is your personal property, mm-hmm. and because of that, you know, I can't as a veterinarian, unless I see someone literally abusing an animal, I can't say you can't make that choice. Now, as a veterinarian, we try and encourage. We do a physical exam. If someone says. You know, we, we want to euthanize our dog. It's got this, this, and this. So I always go through and say, well, look, these things are fixable. That's going to take a little time and a little money. These are not so fixable. And, you know, but even at that, people come in with a decision. And then the part that drives me really crazy, if I say, well, let me take this animal into my rescue group, we'll find a home for it. I think there's guilt there or something exactly. because they refuse to let me have the animal. I go, what the heck? There's nothing wrong with this animal other than, you know. But they also, I think, well, I can't speak for these people, but I think it's possible that they also don't want the animal to live like as most rescue dogs do unless they're or cats are in a home. They don't want it to just be in that cage waiting, which could be days, weeks, months, or years. Still alive. <laughs> well, so what? You know what? That's not really, what kind of well, life Well, I don't is know. That? We had one animal that was kind of dumped on us in our rescue, and it had multiple problems and over the course of a year we kept it and we did surgery we did everything we invested a lot into it we ended up sending it out to a sanctuary farm that would take the animal and that animal has a great life but it, it did spend a year a year and a half with us but so be it you know it was still better than it got activity every day it was taken out three four times a day and we have someone that's just dedicated to care but um you know, it's a hard decision. I mean, have you ever dealt with this yourself with your own pets where you have to make that decision at oh, some Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have had, you know, quite a few animals that um, have been 
electively euthanized, but it was, you know, my dog you know, had a heart murmur, he had cancer in his toe, he was 13 and a half, he, I mean, he was just literally a mess. And then the, my other dog, the same thing, was also about 13, a really big dog, and it was to the point where he could bear, he just wouldn't even walk out to the sidewalk, and all day long, all he did was he laid down until I forced him to get up and go outside. So it's, it, it's a situation where they're really at the, it's a quality of life thing, and they're right. really not doing well at all. And either even then, it's just... It's still tough. Oh, it's horrible. But I do agree with you, and that's a point that it's hard to get people to understand. I, I really go crazy when people say, well, I was just hoping that the dog or the cat would die at home. Right. And I go, wait a minute. You know, you have a cat that's in chronic renal failure. It's going to be nauseous, can't eat. It's suffering in some form. And it may not feel physical pain, but, you know, all that nausea and discomfort, you know, where do they get that idea? I always feel like it's better to be, I call it gracious, to electively euthanize when it should be euthanized, like a very, like you said, those scenarios with really sick animals. But best case scenario is that you're not faced with that decision for which for many people like feel like it's not their decision to make. So right, right. they make they may make the decision, but it's really kind of excruciating. It is. And they're just hoping that they don't have to make it, that the, that the animal will just die naturally. But I've also seen a lot of people that actually just, when they get fed up with problems or they don't want the expense anymore, yeah. they just dump the dogs and cats, right, put right. them out and become somebody else's problem or they do or don't survive. Does anybody ever come in and say, you know, I, I think people won't admit if they are just like, I just don't want this animal anymore. Would you just put it down? I can't find a home for it. I have. <laughs> I have seen that before. And, you know, again, you try and find alternatives. And unfortunately, as you and I both know, it's hard to just assume you're going to settle a home, a cat or a dog into a new home or into a rescue program because, unfortunately, many of the rescue programs you know, breathe on air. They don't have any big resources. And the need... Um, is much greater than the... Yeah. yeah. The supply is it's much, much greater, greater than, than demand. demand. Right. right. There's just no place for them to go. And uh, people like, I can get a dog and get a cat any day of the week, a million of them. Exactly. Unless you have something special here. I just went to one of the... and helped out of one of the uh, cat shelters. And, you know, I mean, it's funded, I guess, independently by some different organizations. But I thought, man, they got like a couple hundred, 300, 400 cats in there. And I'm oh, thinking... God. You know, what is the purpose of this if you're not working hard to get a lot of them turned over into new homes? And sometimes it's just new new homes to be. I think that's the truth. I think that, I mean, I can't even tell you how many times I've heard, you know, somebody who wants, uh, has a great dog, particularly, and they just need a home. It's just like, um, I, and I'm finally like, I can't help you. I don't, I, I mean, I don't have, like people, I don't have a little list that says, here's the set, the next six people are hoping that I'm going to hear about a dog that they should get. I mean, it just doesn't yeah. exist. Well, uh, the big question then is when, and we talked about some of the inappropriate reasons, I suppose, but a good legitimate time, like you alluded to, is that when you look at your animal, and I tell people this all the time, it's a very personal decision. I can't make it for you. I can only guide you as a veterinarian. But when those normal behaviors are lacking, appetite is lost. Uh, the condition of the animal is going down because of some chronic illness, and it's obvious that it looks miserable. Um, when they're not happy, when they're crying out in pain uh, intermittently or continuously, those are good reasons, I think. Yeah. that you can say, okay, let's do this. I agree. But and then how do we do it? I think, um, you know, I was teasing earlier, but um, unfortunately the prison system has difficulty in when they have to uh, put someone to sleep in the prison system. They seem to struggle and make a lot of mistakes. And in veterinary medicine, unfortunately, I guess because we're so practiced at it, we always put an intravenous catheter in. And then what we do with the owner there or absent, whatever they choose, we usually give them some kind of anesthetic that takes them out of consciousness. And this is when I say, t say goodbye. This is when you're going to say goodbye. And then we give them a shot in, in the IV that stops the heart. And that's the most gracious, humane way I know to do it. The animals aren't conscious. They don't seem to respond at all. Uh, the other methods we used to use years ago, some of the crazy drugs like barbiturates and stuff, a lot of times you'd see them writhe around and oh suffer. Oh, my God. It is horrible. I think it's yeah. why my kids would never become veterinarians. So, And then my question is, what do you do after? You know, What yeah. are your choices? 
Have you done any of the crazy things? Like uh, I can't, I, you know, <laughs> well, the last time that I did it, it was at your office. You were out of town, and I was, I went oh, in sure, thinking I was going to be really <laughs> fine, and I was just blubbering and, I mean, crying so hard I couldn't even function. So I really... Somebody needs to just deal with it then. I mean, I'm not going to leave that animal during that time. Personally, I don't want to leave them. I want to be mm-hmm. with them. But then I'm I'm cooked. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, I know they go in the freezer. And that they go in the freezer. That's what happens in case everybody wants to know. And, oh, I and thought then they went into a holding facility. <laughs> <laughs> and cremated, which I, I think is a reasonable thing to do anyway, cremation. So I'm all about, I'm all for that. But we had a little... Um, hamster one time we just buried him in a box in the backyard well that's kind of nice and i do allow for people i i tell them if it's a dog or a cat you really have to bury them like three or four foot deep in order to avoid predators that dig them up and stuff like that so but with little animals i think it's nice for the young kids usually are associated with that and give them a, a closure some kind of event so they see that this is okay as best it can be so i agree with you but there are facilities that not only do you just do basic cremation there are organizations that do that but you can also do cremation with an urn returned yeah and some people like to have that kind of memory thing or there are facilities that actually do a true cemetery burial and people you know all the options are out there and people choose what they want and I don't think there's any right or wrong. And I think that there's hospice services actually, where there are. you know more um, and more people so. come to your house, and 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 there's also groups that are deal with the um, therapeutically help you sort of grieve for this for these animals because um, well, that's there important. Are lots of people who I mean their hearts are broken. Well, I think mourning is expected, and I think it's encouraged. But I always tell people. That doesn't mean you should look back and guilt yourself. If you make that decision, let it ride. Because otherwise, I've seen, I remember one person in particular put their cat to sleep and they fought over the decision, finally did it, and then they suffered for weeks. And they blamed themselves. I think they blamed us for convincing them. I don't know. But um, it can be really tough. So I think it's important to encourage people to remember the good things and the good times and understand that you did it for the right reasons. If you do it for the wrong reasons, that's a tough one. you know. And if you just demand, that's my pet. I want it euthanized. I don't want to go any further. That's not the best thing in the world. So again, this is a very tough topic. You can ask the veterinarian for like a a footprint or some hair collected. A lot of people like that, some kind of commemoration of their pet and um, or an urn. And I think you just have to do it in conjunction with your family first. Then you go with your vet and you sit down and talk about the method and what's gonna happen and just survive it. We're gonna stop for now. We're gonna come back and Cindy's gonna drive us uh, our topic with some training tricks right so it'll be cindy vickers and dr doug pernikoff of dr doug's all things animal radio show and we'll be back in just a moment wish that i could travel his way way. welcome back everybody we're in our third section of Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show, and we had some interesting and a bit sad discussions. First, about uh, preempt control and managing your animals as the weather gets colder and colder towards winter. And then we just visited and talked about euthanasia, a sad but important subject. And now Cindy wanted to talk about one of her favorite <laughs> subjects, reward versus punishment. So can you first defi- define punishment? I mean, is this yes, always physical? I can. Okay. Well, I think this is really important for people to understand this foundational idea and really get it. If you are going to reward your, let's just say dog, but it applies to cat, it applies to hamsters, it applies to pigs, it applies to any any being that you're training. To reward any behavior. Did you look at me when you behavior, said pig? <laughs> I did not. To reward any behavior means that you want to do something to that dog or make something happen for that dog that will cause it to increase the behavior. You mean? So for the example of I want my dog to sit, anytime the dog sits, if I give the dog some kind of reward, I'm not gonna say what, just some kind of reward, it should 
make the dog want to do or attempt to do that behavior more, attempt to sit more. Can it be just a hug and a kiss and a compliment, it a can, verbal? It can be anything that causes them to do it more. So that anything makes them happy or excites them? If it causes them to increase the behavior, it is a reward. Uh, it, it voluntarily increases the behavior. It is a reward. I guess I'm a so f- learner. So <laughs> generally speaking, it's food or petting or just some kind of really happy, um, loving voice. A punishment is anything that causes the behavior to decrease or stop. Now, granted, in reward, you want to not just increase the behavior generally, you want to have something that's solid, like if I tell the dog to lay down, if I tell the dog to stay, they will do it first time, I can count on it. So those are just levels of training to get to that point. And punishment also, generally, if there's something that you don't want your dog to do, and again, I'm just using dog, but it applies to any being with a brain, means that you you want the behavior to stop generally, (laughs) Uh not just decrease. But that is the definition of the two. So. But what is a punishment then? Give me an example. Okay, I'm gonna give you an example. Should you never be physical in your punishment or? Well, um, let me just tell you what punishment is or what it can look like. A punishment could be, again, it could be anything that starts to diminish or stop the behavior. So for, uh, this is a great one. This is an example. It's in Karen Pryor's book, Don't Shoot the Dog. It was an accidental punishment. It's a cat jumped on a counter and the owners don't want the cat on the counter, but and this, this was early on, the cat jumped on the counter and there happened to be like a big cookie sheet or something metal on the counter that fell off with a big bang on the floor, scared the cat, jumped off the counter, did, the cat wanted no part of that counter again. So something negative or, or something in the cat's view bad happened when they jumped on the counter and they made that association that jumping on the counter caused this bad clanking noise to happen and never wanted to go on the counter again. So a word about punishment. Generally speaking, you cannot ease into it. It has to be like fast and furious. And associated with the crime. Oh, absolutely. And so you have to be thinking about timing. So you only have just there's well, there's just different there's differences in the saying, but really you have two seconds. You want to try to be you're so funny. You want to try to be instantaneous with when they when the animal does this behavior. You don't want something happens that they don't like right away. I have had two dogs in my life that if I just went oh oh that was it for them that was punishment because they were just like oh my goodness what have I done I'm so sorry I'll never do two that dogs again. and one husband. <laughs> <laughs> but but two times I had dogs that were that soft that well, I let me could ask just you go. Something. How, just, go ahead. No, I was just wondering, wouldn't correction be a better word than punishment? Because I'm thinking of a scenario where the well, listen to me, where the dog let's say a puppy and he's kind of biting and nabbing at you, but if you, you don't necessarily punish him, you just divert his his attention to another reaction. So yeah. you hold him or something. It's not really punishing him, it's correcting him. So does that make sense? That uh, I think people would like that to make sense, but really, if you if you just want to sort of look at the science of it or be accurate, punishment is what stops the behavior. Diverting attention is just something completely different. It's that that is what it's what exactly what it says. You're just diverting them. Does that mean that they will um, stop the behavior? It might. Yeah, it might not. Um, they might just just decide that you've introduced something that's more interesting, so therefore they stop the behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not saying that that diversion can't stop an unwanted behavior, but I just it might think be just a temporary fix. Versus it may or may not be, but I yeah. just think people really start need to start understanding what exactly they're doing because people get really mixed up with training and make a make their lives harder and confuse their animals when they don't really understand if they're rewarding a behavior or punishing behavior. You just don't like that word punishment because mm-hmm. it sounds mean. Mm-hmm. You never have to lay a hand on the dog to Still punish them. Yeah. It just depends upon if it worked. But do you have to make a distinction between training and correcting aberrant behaviors? So, I mean, there's kind of a difference there, isn't there? One is you're is that trying like to build. aberrant? Yeah, you're that your, your way? Okay. Um, it, well, I'm sorry, the question is, is it different difference well, between do you training have to make and a correcting? Yeah, if you're in a training mode where you actually want to instill new responses, okay, for this, this dog is triggered to respond because you're giving it kind of a, uh, a cause. But 
on the other hand is if you have an animal that does something let's say decides to hike his leg everywhere that's you're trying to change your behavior you're not training him really are you you're correcting him again i love that no i'm punishing him if he lifts his leg i'm going to scream no no but it's not a, what i'm saying is it's not a training function a reward punishment basis it's different it's strictly a uh, a, rep- a punishment it's not a that does not part of the collective i'm 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 rewarding to get a good response and punishing to get uh no response if i if there was a question in there i do not know what it was but <laughs> yeah it's all part of training though um okay. but again it's pun- but and people can say i'm a positive reinforcement trainer which means that they use no punishment whatsoever right C- it, by definition but often people will just go ah, 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 ah if they see the puppy starting to do something by definition that that ah, 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 is punishment. punishment so anything that st- stops the behavior and it can be the gentlest thing in the world or you could say and i don't recommend this you could hit the dog in the head with a two by four if it doesn't stop the behavior or lessen it it would not be considered punishment <laughs> so now what how about uh those cases i think we've talked about this before but let's say you have a dog that just barks incessantly mm-hmm. and you want to get a bark collar and i still kind of believe that if those are used correctly and for short term they can be very effective do you think that's just an absolute no no you should never go to that no extreme? i don't but i think that you um you might not have to go to that and i and f- often there is a lot of training that's missing i think that that at least maybe the in my opinion it makes me a little bit sad to see somebody just go right to a bar collar when they've skipped a whole bunch of things that, uh, that they're not done. dealing with underlying behaviors because or the or the precursors to mm-hmm. that behavior. So um, it, d- dogs that bark incessantly often have no training at all. Mm-hmm. They there's there's nothing that they do where they listen to their owner if they have anything better to do, even if they listen to their owners when or they might not listen to their owners when they don't have anything better to do Mm -hmm. so generally there's little to no training and um often a lot of boredom and the little to no training also looks like a lot of boredom and um not a great sense of you know where your place should be in this family like you're um you're not the boss of me kind of Mm -hmm. thing so sometimes if you can if you correct that um you don't have to go to that collar because dogs don't bark incessantly who generally who have training they just don't so then you have the scenario where you have young puppies or young pets coming into your home versus a rescue Mm -hmm. and the rescue we know is we don't know what's in their history we don't Mm -hmm. know what they've been exposed to and good or bad so do you take a whole different approach obviously in your management it's still a basic reward and punishment well i generally tell people to treat um a rescue like it's a brand new puppy Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of housebreaking everything just it's generally you might just fly through something you'll find out that the dog indeed and one day when they figure out where the back door is their house broken but i but from the moment they come in i would treat them like they were a puppy but reward and punishment is simply is a way to accomplish um putting a behavior on command so again the punishment can be very very small it can be relatively non-existent if you are a really ineffective positive reward trainer Mm -hmm. and that's what you're focusing on but again even if you go ah 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 that's that's not a positive reward so just i want to just say where this all started so i was reading an article today about pet pigs Mm -hmm. and um and it was about is it having a pet pig right for you and and in this article this woman who owned a pig was saying how when the pig squeals this is one of the things you might not like about having a pig so the pig does that loud pig squeal and then it gets somebody up and so it gets attention so it just got rewarded for that and then they said the next thing is they're doing it at instead of at eight o'clock at night it's at midnight so this time you give them a treat because you're trying to get them to stop squealing (laughs) so what you so this is an example of rewarding a behavior and so you get more of it yeah so that's a bad response well but you need to be real clear about what is rewarding and what is punishment when Uh you're going into even owning an animal so you don't get what you don't want and you get what you do want well, that's a yeah, you know, and that's a hard distinction sometimes is you do something just like raising kids you do things and all of a sudden you get a response that you didn't expect it's not what you want and you've got to be it's consistency is part of the game too I well I, I find that people it's it, it is not hard for them to understand it but it's just nowhere in their wheelhouse to be thinking this way 
<clears throat> excuse me, when they're when they're looking at their their pet. And so once you just show them like, oh, this is what happened, and here's how we can fix it, they're like, oh, I got it. Of course. Yeah. Wonderful. I really appreciate the discussion, and thank you very much. I mean, you're a very learned person. <laughs> <laughs> Not only beautiful, but intelligent. Okay, so, we'll be so right deep back. in here, but thank you so much, Dr. Pernikoff. <laughs> we'll be back for our recap session. Cindy Vickers, our host, co-host for today, regarding all kinds of interesting behavior. And Dr. Doug Pernikoff will be back in just a moment. We're back in our final segment of Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show, and Cindy and I have had an interesting day speaking first about uh, pet winterization, and then we had a tough topic on euthanasia, a very important topic, and then Cindy led the game in uh, our topic on training Brief. animals. So we have a recap. So was there anything you learned about today, anything that, through the subject matter? Is there anything that I learned today? We didn't teach you a new we big want, word. Do you want to, can I, no. No, I'm I sorry. pretty much knew everything we yeah. talked about today. <laughs> but that's okay, because I just don't know that much about anything else. I don't think it's necessarily aberrant. I think it's aberrant is acceptable, too. Do you? Like, like it's not really harass anyway, it's Harris. Yeah, yeah. That's I a mean, preferred pronunciation. Right, right, right. Maybe we could just do suggesting, a show on that. You know, how come my staff keeps calling me Harvey? Every time I, I talk to him. Oh, <laughs> that's going to be the new coin thing. Uh, they did a Weinstein, right? Yeah, you did a Weinstein. Mm-hmm. That's right. Well, I thought it was an interesting topic. Uh, the how euthanasia. Did that, how did we go? How did that come up? Even? I don't We're know. Just, I don't know. It was on my brain. Wow. Yeah. Oh, okay. Shocker. <laughs> the euthanasia topic is always tough, and you can talk about this a lot more. But again, I t- I'd like to summarize for people that, you know, think through it. Talk to your family and kind of schedule some time with the veterinarian. They can help you with decision making. And then again, whatever decision you make, you do it out of an a honest heart and you don't do anything that's going to allow the animal to undergo any undue, uh, inhumane kind of behaviors or management. And you have to, uh, it's tough for a lot of people to look past their own feelings on behalf of the animal's feelings. Mm. And that always frustrates me, but you have to be so cautious because you don't know how they're going to trigger and respond. Sometimes I think I'm talking to a client and they get it, and all of a sudden you turn your head, it was like a Groundhog Day. You're starting all over again. They just don't get it. But that is a tough topic and a very personal decision. Uh, in terms of your uh, training, uh, the punishment reward system seems like the appropriate thing to well, say. Well, no, I, I don't mean for it to be a system. I just want people to be able to begin this conversation and understand what is reward, what is punishment, um, and is it, are, are you being effective? If you're rewarding your pet and the behavior is getting better if, mm-hmm. or close to fabulous, then you are effectively rewarding them. If you are trying to get them to stop something, there are a variety of ways, not always just punishment, but by definition, if it's not stopping, then your punishment is ineffective. It doesn't huh. have to be brutal and you don't have to train with punishment. But so you mean with physicalness? I mean. No, I mean with punishment, period. You don't have to train that way. That's what the whole positive, re- we need to have a whole show on this. Yeah, but yeah. even like you said, positive reinforcement is still, that's almost like a diversion. We talked about well, positive reinforcement oh my God, <laughs> is something that you do. Uh-huh. You do. It doesn't have to be food, but something that you do. So it's positive. It's you not do. the absence of something mm-hmm. that would cause them to increase the behavior. Mm. You can train exclusively doing positive, positive reward. reward. And then regarding the cold. Again, we're kind of early right now, but I want people to start thinking about it. Watching uh, their behaviors of the animals. Watch how much time they're outside. Uh, don't take anything you know, out of consideration, be concerned and be responsible. But bundle up and go outside. They still need exercise. Take them right, for a walk, right. even when it's really 30, cold. 40 minutes is okay. We didn't talk about real quickly, but the clothing is okay, right? These people, they even have booties for, for yeah. dogs. And I don't think there's a problem with those. And I think the, the coats, coats and the hats, they may not need them as much as people think they do, but I don't think they're hurtful. I mean, my dogs, when it's hot as can be, will get up underneath the blankets and they just, I don't know how they breathe under there, but they like it. I guess it's comfortable for them. Yeah. So Why would that be bad? I mean, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. But Yeah. It's I just, mean, people make a fortune out of that industry. Exactly. Somebody needs that help from you. I want to thank you again and my wonderful co-host, Cindy Vickers, for being here. 
And I want to thank our special guest today, Cindy Vickers, who's our co-host. And, we and Doug will... Pernikoff. <laughs> and this is Dr. Doug Pernikoff. If you need to find Cindy for training issues, call her at 636-530-1808. If you need Dr. Pernikoff for help, call him at 636-530-1808. And that's our clinic, Clarkson Wilson Veterinary Clinic. And we are so excited to be here for you every week. We will see you next week. <laughs> Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.